So how many of you all have actually been through an LCME visit? Okay, couple. How many have an impending um, LCME visit coming up? Okay. <laughs> and so this is frequently sort of how this feels when we, whenever you talk about the, the LCME. And so for those of you who might not have dealt with this yet, and I'll, I'll give you the background of how I became a clerkship director. So I had um, gone to a community setting. I practiced there for about four or five years. At some point in time, I decided that it just wasn't the best fit, and I thought I wanted to be a, te a clinical teacher and work with residents. Um, I was just a baby attending when the Good Doctor House was uh, um, at ECU. And so I became the clerkship director when our then clerkship director became suddenly ill and they needed, and I was in Italy and my chair called and said, I need you to be clerkship director starting on Monday. There's slows that need to be done and um, that need to be done from the last cohort or two of students that had not been done yet that I did not know. And so good luck, have at it. And so that's how I sort of stumbled into the role or was shoved into it and it wasn't really sort of a planned path for me. And within a couple of years, we went from being an elective rotation to being a required rotation and then lo and behold, the LCME was coming and yet I knew nothing about it. And so this is really, you know, it's these ideas that there's these standards and this um, really a peer assessment. But the, the context has changed in that they really are focusing a lot more on quality improvement. And so it's the process of how you go about lay, laying out what needs to be improved and how you're uh, going about improving those within your rotations. Um, there is something called a data collection instrument. If you have not looked at it and you have an LCME visit coming up, I would really encourage you to do so. Because even if you just look at the summary document that d gives the description of the standards, it doesn't really give you an idea of what types of information that they're looking for. And when you pull out this 150-ish page sort of book of questions that they want you to be able to answer in detail, and a lot of this will come from your Office of Medical Education, but it, but it does begin to say, well, you know, give your response for how, you know, what your rate of direct observation is. And you're like, oh, I was supposed to be asking about this or I didn't even know I was supposed to be doing these things. So at least looking through this um, does give you an idea of the types of expectations that you're being held to. And certainly if you're a required clerkship, there's a lot, there's a lot higher level of expectation for you compared to if you're an elective um, rotation. And so there's a lot of different, there's committees that are involved in this. Um, and then there's also something called an independent student analysis. So no matter how great you think your product is, if your students don't think it's a great product, and, and, and sometimes if there's a huge mismatch, they expect to have some questions related to that and that you'll need to be able to explain. Um, the, the standards are broken down into 12 different standards and 93 elements. The standards 6, 7, 8, and 9 are largely the ones on curriculum that you might be interested in looking at. And the timeline really begins about 15 months before the LCME comes. There's a process, your medical school will direct this, but there's a lot of work that goes into this in the writing. And so if you know you have a visit coming, it's actually pretty important to go ahead and get that. You'll get those dates about two years in advance and you need to put those on your calendar because people are going to expect you to be there. You should not intentionally plan to be away or on vacation that week, which you know some does um, cross somebody's, some people's mind. And also you shouldn't like even plan a root canal. Um, it, really, it really will be okay and the process is actually will help you improve. And so thinking about how to implement change is a critical piece of that. The other thing you should do is actually think about how you document the changes that, that you embark upon. So all of us, I think, do this inherently as part of we want our clerkship to be better, but we're not always so good about how does that get re reported and how does the um, medical school know about this and what process do they, do they understand. Um, 
The LCME used to actually give you scores if, if you did like exemplary, they would really note that the things that you did well, but they've changed the categories this year. So you're either satisfactory, satisfactory with the need for monitoring, or unsatisfactory on each of the standards. And nobody really is getting satisfactory on everything. Every medical school has little blips along the way that you're going to have challenges. And those will change over time somewhat. Um, but, but just, so there's, they don't have a magic number of if you are, if you get this many, you're going to be put on, um, that this many unsatisfactory, unsatisfactories is going to be a problem. It's really sort of the compilation of what the total picture looks like. And so for you as the clerkship director, the question is, you know, are there, there are areas that have come up in the past that have been problem areas? You really need to get those things um, fixed. If there are things that have come up in your student and your independent sur student survey, if, they're, if they say that, you know, we're always mistreated in the emergency department or they don't have adequate facilities for students, those are things to really focus on as well. And if you have, when you're co collecting that information across in your database, it, these are things that are going to have more questions associated with them when you're writing the report. A lot of times within institutions, the things that are problematic in one area come up across multiple clerkships. And so there's, there's really ways that for you to become, to come together with other um, clerkship directors to be able to think about how to problem solve related to those. And that's really one of the reasons there's so much sort of cross-learning between both other specialties as well as clerkship directors that if you can become involved in the curriculum committee, even if you're not on the curriculum committee, but they have an opportunity for you to go and visit and you can sit in on the meetings, that's really helpful and insightful for thinking about how to improve the clerkships. So. Um, when we talk about frequently cited standards, we're going to go through a couple of these. We've already covered the learning environment and um, student mistreatment. Um, sometimes as clerkship directors, especially in emergency medicine, and if you're not a required clerkship, sometimes being able to meet an institutional need for one of these other standards actually can help thrust you from being an elective clerkship into becoming a required clerkship because it's a way for you to be able to demonstrate that you can provide an institutional need. So if you know that the, the institution is having difficulty documenting that students have the opportunity for self-directed learning, whether it's like evidence-based medicine questions or that they're having to define their own objectives and come back and sort of present those, you can think about how you can actually fill a niche relate for your institution. Um, curriculum management, curriculum design, review, and monitoring, those are things that kind of go hand in hand. Part of these um, should come up if you have a required clerkship, you should be having some sort of um, clerkship review process by which the students and faculty, other faculty review your clerkships and identify any concerns about the clerkships or things that you're doing well. Um, preparation of residents, we've alluded to, and then as as Nick also mentioned, the assessment system and how you actually assess your learners. So this is probably a real big thing to get over and that's embracing the process. So it's a, these, I actually had thoughts of who these different people were as I was picking <laughs> out their picture for our curriculum committee um, because I'm the person usually tasked with delivering whatever bad news of how we're performing and how we need to improve things and and they, uh, it's remarkable how much they resemble one another. Um, people have the tendency to say, great, if we check this box and we're done, right? And that's really, I think, what gets people into trouble with the LCME is really just the goal is for you to continue to improve the process and it's not necessarily, you're never going to achieve perfection, but it's about the process and about Reviewing, reviewing data, looking at it, and continuing um, to implement new things, to change things, and to think about how to get better. Um, we had one of our faculty who, in the, while we were in the midst of a curriculum change, said, so if we do this, you promise we won't have to do any more changes. No, that isn't the way this works. Um, and so thinking about how you can contribute. There's some things that are some absolute must, and there's some ways in which you can contribute. 
So one of the standards for direct is for direct observation. The real burden of this is placed on the third year rotation. So if you have something in the third year, it's probably, uh, there might be a bit more burden for you if you have a required M3 rotation. But there has to be a system of direct observation. In the graduation questionnaire, it does ask a, a specific question of were you observed doing a history, and then a separate question of were you observed doing a physical exam. We have personally struggled with this one over the past couple of years as our acuity and um, some staffing changes have been made across the institution. I can tell you that multiple clerkships have all been going, having a downward trend, which we recognize as being a significant problem for us. And so when we began, we, we implemented a sort of review preview form for all the clerkship directors, and what we found is they all said, well, we don't do this, but other people do it super well, except everybody said that. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of direct observation forms that are out there. There's no, nothing that is actually set that you have to use one. This is the mini CEX form. You could actually have completely qualitative forms. But the other way, even if they're not asking specifically on the GQ on emergency medicine, were you, uh, were you directly observed, it does help this to emphasize to the student how important it is. And I think there is, um, it sort of adds in some positive recollection bias when the students are being observed. How many of you all have teaching residents as part of your rotation? We use teaching residents for this. The teaching residents, typically, they only have two students. They don't have any personal responsibility for patient management. And one of our jobs as clerkship directors is to make sure that the students understand that they don't have to be observed by faculty. So as part of, we had a sort of a mini task force to come together, and our students said, we've never been observed. And I'm like, really? You've never been observed? You're doing pelvic exams all over the place without the attending in the room. No, there's always someone with us. And so being able to break it down for them, you don't have to observe the entire history and physical together. It can be bits and pieces and parcels that are divided over the clerkship is completely um, acceptable. But this, all, and this can be done in OSCEs potentially as well as in simulation. Um, it can also be linked, there's some other requirements relative to narrative assessment where students have to get written feedback on their performance. And so this, can, uh, this is really a simple fix to be able to write a couple of lines and provide them with feedback on what they did well or what they need to work on as well as formative feedback, because students also have to have the opportunity to improve. Any questions about, about direct observation? All right. Their standard 6.2 and 8.6 go hand in hand. They, I, I don't understand why they actually aren't linked together a little bit closer, but this actually just says that the, the faculty of a medical school have to define the types of patients that students have to see. So you have to define what the, what the patient complaint or experience or diagnosis is, the clinical condition. You have to actually say what the clinical setting is going to be, and then the expected level of student responsibility. Did they observe it? Do they do it? And you can make up your definitions. You also actually have to provide some alternative teaching um, methodologies so if they do not see that, that, that you can ensure that they do. So this are, these are a list of some of ours. I think emergency medicine is a little bit of a struggle because technically we're ambulatory and yet bag mass ventilation is one of our, ta one of our clinical conditions, a procedure that the students have to do. Um, and it looks really weird to me to put ambulatory, so I tend to put, we have tended to vote it a lot on either inpatient or outpatient for a number of these. But then these all have to be tracked. So we have struggled with ensuring that the students do this at the end of every rotation. And so now we've instituted a mechanism where um, at the beginning of the last week of the rotation, we pull their data together centrally. We send it to the clerkship directors. The clerkship directors and coordinators stalk the students to ensure that it's all completed. And then we do another report again at the end of the week. But it's a requirement for graduation, so all of the students have to um, participate in those things. 
again, this is a really good fit for emergency medicine to have some of these required um, clinical conditions because we see a vast number of different types of patients, especially for the more acute patients. We probably have a lot more variability and can provide these experiences. Um, you'll notice that our, our, we have targeted patient encounters because, you know, if you didn't see that one patient with hypertension, we can just send you into a different room. And so we, a lot of these things um, are, are things that every medical student is going to see. Do you, are you all familiar with your list of required conditions at your school? Okay. Monitoring them has actually become a little bit more challenging in the last version of the DCI you actually have to provide reports centrally uh, or reports for the D, uh, for, to the LCME if more than 25% of things are seen in a um, simulated environment or a non-patient care environment. For us, that ends up being bag valve mask lar uh, ventilation largely. But I think, I think we can really validate we don't have enough patients that need to be bagged imminently while a medical student happens to be by that that is something that is reasonable to occur in a simulated environment. I did not know this when I became a clerkship director, so grades must be turned in within six weeks. This is a hard and fast, there's not a lot of room for negotiation. And when the LCME comes, you have to provide a report for when grades are turned in. Um, I think sometimes we have eked in a little bit under the radar just because at, at one time it was an elective and so people weren't paying as much of a, attention. But making sure that you know that is important. And your student office of student affairs or your registrar should be tracking this information. Okay, the school might be different. Like, so we do kind of like the, the red, yellow, green. So green is within four weeks. Yellow is within the six weeks and the red is greater than the six. So our goal is actually to get in within four weeks. So basically within one period um, for our students since they rotate every four weeks. I was just going to ask you how stringent they are on that. So my question is how stringent they are on that. I can tell you that every block we probably have, I don't know, maybe between one and four grades that are late. and. A lot of them are away rotations, so students go on aways and we don't get their grade back from the away. And as far as I know, that still counts for us. Um, so I don't have a site visit on the imminent future, but I know I need to tighten that up for my academic program. Do you think if it stays at that level of two to four late grades, I guess for the year that would be 25 late grades for 200 students is that that seems high to me I guess now that I'm saying I'm like I, I have a problem here so if you're doing a visiting rotation somewhere else Some or, or they're doing a component of your home rotation Some, there it's a combination of both um, the away rotations are a portion but we do have some home you know, like surgery, the coordinator left and a new one came in and we had some confusion about grades. So I bet over the course of the year, it, it wasn't, it's probably not as high as 25, but I bet we've had between 8 and 10 for the year. And I guess I'm wondering if I had a site visit this year, if we'd get cited for that. So we actually, we were cited because for, at our last LCME visit because um, our psychiatry clerkship director was on maternity leave part of it but you have to actually provide like your average day of return for each of the cohorts um, or for for each of the clerkships so how many what's the average number of days so I think it's a challenge I think they have pretty much a hard and fast rule of they are supposed to be turned in and that and I think they actually ask for the number of exceptions for that so as much as you really can talk with your faculty and your preceptors um, at, about how to get that information in, it's critically important. And th it's been a challenge. I think at some point, if you're trying to get shift evaluations from multiple people, you have to figure out what's the minimum number that you need and just, I think at some point, just get the grades done. And one thing we, that was a problem for us. So. The way we got around that is we have a computer-based 
CPA that's based on the CDEM um, clinical performance assessment. And every student has to hand their iPad to the attending at the end of their shift, and it has to be completed as a record of their attendance. And that has been kind of a foolproof way of the students know they need this for their attendance check. The attendings know they have to fill it out. And we always have assessment data for, for our clerkship, at least. But there's been other ones that have been more the issue. Um, um, are you required to do exit interviews for every medical student based on for, site visit? Is the site visit going to want documentation of every exit interview for all the medical students? And when you say exit? I mean, like when they leave the rotation, you have to sit down and give them like formal feedback. No. There, so the formative, the formative assessment and feedback, the standard very specifically reads that you have to give them for, formative feedback early enough in the learning experience in order for them to modify their behavior, essentially. So this is really mid-rotation feedback. Um, there's a lot of discussion, I think, sometimes as to what, what that means. Do you have to sit down face to face? Can it be a delegate? Some people assign mentors or use other people to, to help fulfill that need. We, we ha schedule face to face um, sessions with our student, with either the clerkship director or the assistant clerkship director. And there's actually becoming a higher expectation of this even within electives. Um, as to how you're going to provide formative feedback to students. And um, so one of the challenges, too, is that even though we knew we were doing on some of our rotations 100% sit-down, mid-term, mid-clerkship feedback with them, the students, we still didn't have 100% on the GQ. And so, again, the, the GQ is a retrospective analysis, right? They're asked at the end of medical school to remember all of their Third, now a lot of schools are going to Vanderbilt's, like at what most of their core rotations in the second year, but they're being able to ask to reflect back of did you receive mid rotation feedback in all of these? Were you directly observed in surgery, regardless of how long ago it was? So we actually have our students do a self assessment. They ha have to do a reflection before they go sit down at the mid rotation feedback because we actually have found that the students have, we can have a lot better discussion about what needs to be worked on. It helps them remember that you actually sat down if you had to prepare for it and that you had to sit down with the clerkship director so you can remember at least the things that were discussed. And then the students put thought into it, the faculty has put thought into it, and then it's based on the evaluations that you have at that point in time. So again, it's in, as whatever mechanism that you can find, whether it's your coordinator prodding people to return information, um, for us, our actually numbers got worse when we went to an electronic form, so we went back to a shift card and a, a paper copy, but whatever you can do to get the feedback as quickly as possible, because it's not very helpful to the student to sit down with you and you not have any information to provide for them. And nothing is more frustrating than getting to the end of the rotation, that student is not performing as well as what they would like, and yet they've gone the whole month, they don't understand why they haven't gotten feedback from you as far as how to improve, and then you're, you're literally a month behind in helping them, where sometimes these are things that really could be changed relatively easily. Maybe they need to change their presentation style, maybe they were doing, um, that they didn't realize that they were doing something, so they can easily modify those behaviors. So we, yeah, we, we schedule each of the students to sit down either with myself or one of the assistant clerkship directors, even for our other site, you know, we'll actually email the site director to provide even just a couple of lines of feedback for the students that are out there. And then when we do come into it where we have a student, like we actually have this next Monday, even though the period just started, because it's tied to like other simulation and when's the sim center available. So most likely, most of those students won't have uh, actually written feedback. So we actually talk about, again, what their goals are for the rotation, so they do a self-reflection, but also, it's actually sometimes pulling out that you ask students like what kind of feedback they've gotten, and even those that say well, I haven't gotten any, then you start talking about well, here's where students have gotten feedback in the past, and like oh yeah, I, I got that too. So we are kind of calling out some of the differences and maybe the feedback that we do in the ED versus the feedback in other rotations. So even if it's not a written feedback, we'll talk about what maybe verbal feedback they've gotten either about the presentations, about their differentials, you know, other things like that um, is how we end up working it for when we don't have the evaluations back. 
And it doesn't have to be, like this isn't necessarily an hour long. I struggle sometimes with getting, like managing them rapidly and wrapping them up, but it, it can be a 15 minute sit down and have people sort of tapping in and tapping out. We do so, 10 minutes. Uh, well, I started with 10 and I would never actually could stay on time. So Cause That's because you're a talker. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm short into the, into the point. And so um, this is also a great time to review if they have those required clinical conditions, their progress on them because some students do tend to wait until that last week of the rotation to document those things. So it begins to also prime them up for residency and the documentation that's required for that process as well. Um, this is a, um, an example of what our form looks like. We just ask for the, the clerkship director has to summarize the strengths, the opportunities to improve. We've tried to avoid weaknesses. Sort of their, um, their logbook and the progress that they're making on that. And then if there are any professionalism concerns, we've actually added a component of if for the student on their reflection, also to be able to bring up if there's any learning environment or supervision concerns to be able to con um, track those and be able to address those as early as possible because then that at least gives you an opportunity to discuss with the student if they're concerned about some sort of behavior that they've witnessed and sometimes they just need to debrief about that and talk about what happened. Okay. Um, Shift cards, you, this goes along with both the assessment. These are both, these have the opportunity to be formative because we are getting so, because you're getting so many shift assessments. They're formative in that it's a one shift only sort of piece of this. It doesn't impact, but it does have the potential to help them identify where they can improve along the way. Also, and this is a copy of the NCAT EM form also provides that narrative feedback to students that, so that you're meeting that requirement. I think most students will tell you that the narrative information, if written well, which frequently requires faculty development, is probably the most helpful aspect of the evaluations and what really helps them modify their, their behaviors. So curriculum management. This is something that people unintentionally get into some tricky places with. So if you don't know it, you should go and find them, but every medical school has institutional learning objectives that represent the entire curriculum. The way the LCME reads is that those should, you, that the um, objectives for your rotation should be based on your institutional learning objectives. So you should start with the institutional learning objectives in mind and then base, write your objectives for your clerkship based on those. I think many of us probably use the CDEM sort of national type of ob objectives and have morphed those, but you need to make sure that when the LCME comes that you can frame that appropriately as to how your institutional learning objectives um, framed that, how you use them at your institution. And for ours, for all of our learning objectives for our rotation actually document which one of the institutional learning objectives it applies to. So it'll have our, our direct, our, our um, objective that'll say ILO X to, to say specifically which one we're referring to for the institutional level. That ties into curriculum mapping. Are any of you all familiar with curric curric curriculum mapping? It's currently the bane of my existence at the moment. Um, we use E-value for this process and it, uh, we are struggling with how to get these things in the map and that you can use them in a functional way. So the idea is that should you come in and you, and you notice what, when you're seeing fourth year medical students at the end that not a single one of them know how to do a neuro exam well. That you could look back at your curriculum map and determine all of the touch points at, when they, at which they had instruction on this. Um, in reality, it, it's really a much more difficult process to whether you're using MeSH keywords. But every didactic, in addition to their learner objectives that, you, that may come about through the clinical setting, but then the, all of your sessions, your simulations, need objectives and keywords to go with them so that they can be tracked if you have a required rotation. If you change objectives, this is really typically something that's managed by the curriculum committee. And so if you're making, based on what your bylaws at your school are, because there's supposed to be central oversight of the curriculum by your curriculum management structure, 
that if there are major changes to your clerkship, those need to be approved by your curriculum committee. This is something that frequently in the very beginning, you're just trying to improve your rotation and probably may not know how that process works. And so we've had some challenges with that. But especially if you're dropping something from your clerkship objectives, that may be the only place in the curriculum where that, where that components really hit hard. So if you're dropping things, you need to make sure that everybody's clear and that that's okay and it's either redun unnecessarily redundant so that other people are teaching it or that it can be swapped around if it's important content. Um, review and revision of the curriculum is one of those other um, topics that comes under fire. And this, is, this really is talking about the school overall. So there, within the DCI, you have to describe how you review your curriculum overall, how you review phases of your curriculum, whether that's like foundational science or the clerkship years, and then how you review all of your courses and clerkships. So for most of us, it's the course and clerkship review process that we're most concerned about. And your school should have a, a process by which that's set up. For us, that includes um, looking at all of, we do that on about every three year basis. It's a major clerkship review. We have other course and clerkship directors involved with that. We have students involved in the process. We look at all of the qualitative comments for those three years, as well as all of the, um, the end of clerkship evaluations. We look at how we did on the GQ. We look at our um, MBME shelf exam and the different content areas. And it's really everything's on the table and we sort of strategize ways to improve it. Sometimes as the clerkship directors, that, that feels like it's a process that you're uh, maybe being persecuted or there's things, you know, everybody always wants to get honors, right? I mean, I'm, we are still those people. And, but I would encourage you to look at that as opportunities to leverage for the things that you want or need. So if you need more faculty to participate in your clerkship and you're not receiving good evaluations because the students don't think you have good resources or the lectures aren't um, up to what they would like to be, you really use this process to leverage for resources. It, if you're not getting those resources from your chair and the LCME is coming, it really becomes very important to um, the, the administration. And that's really one of the ways in which we were able to leverage um, uh, some FTE support so that all of our clerkships have assistant clerkship directors that are funded through the medical school. So think about what you need and how, how to get that. Um, making sure that you have a competency-based curriculum that not only do you need to link to the medical school objectives, but you need to think about what are your measurable outcomes. So everything really needs to have some sort of assessment to go along with that, whether that's um, clerkship, your um, a clinical evaluation tool, whether you're using exams, if you're doing, if you have an evidence-based medicine objective, then you need to think about, well, how are you assessing that? Are you doing it within the context of the clinical shift and having them look up information and bringing it forward? Or do you actually have a formal activity? And if there are things that don't, so make sure that you're not throwing things in the objectives that you really aren't putting meaningful time to or assessing on the end. Um, that it really, everything should go together. We actually use a column approach where you have, where we link it to our institutional learning objectives. We have our clerkship objectives. We describe up front, and the students have access to this too, what the formative assessment and the summative assessment for each of those aspects, and, and our teaching modality. How do we teach that information? Um, teach the teacher, we've touched on a little bit, but you actually have to document um, how you're training your residents as teachers if they're doing evaluations. So anyone who is involved in assessment of the clerkship, you have to document how you're distributing your clerkship objectives to them and how, how you're actually training your teachers, uh, your residents, how to teach and to evaluate the students. And so for us, we, we have a pretty formal process for this, but documentation is key, and whether that's done at an institutional level or a departmental level is for you to decide with, within your school, but those are critical components that um, it's really too late once the LCME is coming to figure out that you've missed that doing that for the past couple of years. And one of the areas that 
can't say we have really had trouble with, but we need to make sure the students are educated on. So one of our sites has residents from other programs there as well. And I can't document what their training they have, so we've actually told our students to not actually just work with those residents. The uh, other institutions faculty know that as well, so they're not uh, directing the students toward these other residents. Uh, but that's something else to kind of think about if you've got multiple sites, are there other residents there? And then can you document that they've had training, or if not, how are you gonna deal with that so you, our, your students are not working with them potentially? And other sites, this is one of the real things that makes me happy that we only have one site, I'll be honest. Um, so if you have multiple sites, you have to be able to document that there's comparability of, amongst the sites. That can be done in a number of different ways. It can be done by looking at evaluations. You can also look at test scores and see that students performed similarly if they went to various sites. And, um, and then you can augment it with various experiences where you either bring them together if there's online instruction. But they're gonna ask how, how are you determining that your students have an equitable experience across every rotation site that you have? And especially if you see that it's coming up on your evaluations that students feel like this site is not a good site and then, and then if you don't have a way to ensure comparability, that's likely to be an issue with the LCME. All right. Self-directed um, learning, this is something that it's really an opportunity for us. I think in emergency medicine, this is something that a lot of places struggle with how to teach and how to assess it. Um, it involves sort of the credibility of resources and you have to be able to provide the student feedback on, on that specifically. Sometimes that's challenging in the curriculum and we might have a niche as to how we fulfill some of those. And then um, making sure this predominantly applies to psychiatric services or mental health services, but if you know that you have seen a student in the ED for a sensitive topic, you are not allowed to evaluate them. So making sure that your faculty know. We had a student several years ago who um, was actually on a psychiatry rotation and had a psychotic episode while in the ED, had to be restrained, and then we really had to do a lot of careful planning to avoid A, that she wasn't, when she came back to do emergency medicine later, that the person who was involved in her care was in no way, we, we really tried to get it so that he wasn't working in the ED while she was working a shift just for the, the issues related to that, but certainly no opportunities to evaluate the students. I think, you know, if you see someone for a sprained ankle while they're a first year medical student, you, there's some sort of reasonable expectation of that, but not for most of the, the other ones. And so these, these are gonna be online. The one other thing that I would point out is if you're using other sites, one of the questions that comes up in the LCME is, do you use people who are non-faculty to teach? And really most of your people, you have to have an affiliation agreement with those other sites. And you should talk with your institution about, we call them affiliate faculty or adjunct faculty but there really should be on faculty if they're teaching as part of required rotation. All right, any questions? The other thing I would just uh, really agree with you is the Alliance for Clinical Educators puts out a clerkship director guidebook. Some of you may have seen it. It has like a yellow cover. I don't know how much it costs. Like 50, 45, 50 bucks, yeah. I think. Um, I would really It's a group of, of learning outcomes that 
are going to tie to what's called the curriculum inventory. The curriculum inventory is, is um, a place where the AAMC is going to inventory all the different things that the medical schools are teaching. So we're kind of going through this process as well, where we're trying to map our objectives to um, this ECRS thing and then to the curriculum inventory. I just mentioned that because The other thing I would say is if um, we would love to have you come to the clerkship uh, directors and emergency medicine, the CDEM meeting on Thursday from 1 to 5. So we're going to be talking about a lot of planning for the upcoming year and what we need to strategize and what um, tools or resources are needed by clerkship directors. So we'd really like to get um, your input as to what you need and what you want and how we can help with that process. Sharing support. Yeah, sharing. Therapy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs>